If you have your scriptures today, let's go over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, a continuation of the message in the very same text from last Sunday. And as we walk into this text, I'd just like to ask you to carefully think about this question. If you are married or if you are contemplating getting married, why? What is the purpose behind it? Why is it that you would want to be married? Notice, if you will, one verse here in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31. For this cause. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Today's message is entitled, A Spirit-Filled Family. This is part two of our message on this text from Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. Shall we pray together? Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the opportunity today just to contemplate your precious design, the way that you designed and arranged marriage in order to point to the grace of our glorious God. Thank you that we can be content in him. Thank you for the remarkable contentment that we have because I, we know that our Lord is in control and he will never leave us nor forsake us. So I ask this day that as we contemplate your ways and think on your word, that you would truly help us to settle into that contentment, the contentment of a cause, the contentment of the certainty that God is at work, yea, even in our marriages. Bless us today. Fill us with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A spirit-filled family. I'm not sure if the slides are working correctly this morning. Are we having uh, difficulty with those? Just want to be sure. Good. Thank you very much. I just want to ask you that question again of why would you get married? Or if you are married, why are you married? Over the years, in a number of premarital counseling situations, and many of you are sitting right here this morning, and praise the Lord, number of marriages. We were marveling, I think it was last Sunday, over uh, decades. I mean, some of you, I just can't believe how long you've been married. The time just cannot have gone by that quickly. And you know that somewhere in that conversation, after I ask you about your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and I ask you if anyone in the family were objecting to your marriage, and is there anybody I need to go see or talk to about that, I ask you the question, so why do you want to get married? And uh, I've seen some of the most remarkable responses over the years, and nobody had ever asked most of them that question before. Why? Well, you know, no, really, why? Why do you want to get married? And they say, well, we love each other. And okay, uh, she's, the, she's the finest young lady I've ever met. He's the finest young man I've ever met. Great, okay, what if you meet someone finer? I, I mean, just please forgive me, but I play what if as a premarital counselor, you know, I ask those kind of questions. And some of the young men will look at me as if to say, well, I'd tell you what my reason is, but, uh, you know, I, you're the preacher, and I can't tell you that what I'm just trying to do is legitimize intimacy somehow or other. And what I try to do is take every one of those reasons apart and show just how fragile they really are. I, I ask this question, it sounds really <laughs> macabre almost to, to ask this, but... Okay, so we go through the wedding day, we go through the ceremony, it's a wonderful occasion, it's a, there's a tremendous celebration, and then we have a reception afterward. And you get in the car and you're headed out on your honeymoon, your wedding trip, and there's a, there's a terrible accident. And that in that terrible accident, one of you goes into a coma for many months. Can you still fulfill the purpose for your marriage 
even then. And when you stop to think about the kinds of stresses and pressures that come on a marriage, it really does raise the question as to why. Why would someone get married? What is, what is the purpose for a marriage? So with that in mind today, I would like to ask this question that you can see there in your manuscript. This is available also online for those of you who are watching online this morning at our sermon page at cbcfindley.org. Why do so many marriages fail? Why do so many marriages fail? It is crystal clear. I believe here from Ephesians chapter five, verses 22 through 33, that we understand that a good marriage needs a good foundation and a good support system, a good foundation and a good support system. It was about noon on March 12, 1928, when three employees of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power inspected the St. Francis Dam the dam was built in San Francisquito Canyon, about 40 miles northwest of Los Angeles during 1924 to 1926. The chief engineer was the now famous William Mulholland. Mulholland was actually a self-educated engineer. He had started out as a tender and supervisor of the trenches and the canals and decided in the evenings he was going to go home and study mathematics uh, and fluid, dy <laughs> fluid dynamics and gravity and uh, a whole host of other things. And so uh, he rose through the ranks. His greatest achievement was actually the Los Angeles aqueduct. He built this in 1908. He actually brought water from 233 miles away in the Owens Valley. It's a relatively arid valley there to the east. And he brought in that uh, water from there and everybody was amazed. Everybody said that William Mulholland had to be one of really the greatest uh, engineers of the time. But it was on that fateful day of March 12th, 1928, it was Mulholland himself who walked along inspecting his creation, the St. Francis Dam. The dam was 175 feet thick at its base, about 16 feet thick at its top. The main structure reached about 205 feet in height, and it spanned about 700 feet between the hillsides. That morning, Mulholland had been called by his the keeper of the dam, his name was Tony, Tony said, I think you need to come out here. And as they walked along, they found a place, this was on the west abutment, right where the dam met the hill. And they found that there was a discharge of water that was coming out at between 15 and 22 gallons per second. But it was intermittent, indicating there was turbulence behind the dam. And then suddenly there would be this just shooting out of water. It immediately brought to mind the passage in Proverbs 17, where it talks about he that lets out water, that is in reference to a dam or a dike, one that lets out water, uh, it's very dangerous, stop before the contention continues. So when they saw that, Mulholland basically said, well, I think this is normal. I, I think this is normal for what we would expect from the dam. Less than 12 hours later, at three minutes before midnight, the St. Francis Dam suffered a catastrophic collapse, releasing 12.4 billion gallons of water in just 70 minutes. Hurtling through the darkness, those devastating waters took more than 400 lives. By some accounts, 431. By some accounts, 450. Uh, the missing uh, were, they, they just don't know. Some consider the St. Francis Dam collapse to be the worst American civil engineering disaster of the 20th century. Okay, the question we would ask is, what happened? What was it that caused that astounding, devastating collapse? Later studies showed that this was a concrete gravity dam, which basically meant made out of concrete and just the sheer weight of the concrete, the weight of it was supposed to hold back those waters. 
but it was insufficient. And the reason it was deficient was for two reasons. Number one was the foundation, and number two was the support system. I would say today that this situation with the St. Francis Dam is very much like a number of marriages that are in danger of collapse. And why would they be in danger? They would be in danger for the very same reason that the St. Francis Dam was in danger. It was a question about its foundation and it was a question about its support system, the side hills that joined in there. In the last message on this text, we really got into this to understand how a marriage is supposed to work. In fact, the last two messages we talked about this. And we went back to Ephesians 5, 17 and began to work all the way down through Ephesians 5, 18 about what it means to be filled by the Spirit. And we went back to Ephesians chapter 3 and noted that as a congregation, we could be filled with all the fullness of God. So here's the Holy Spirit who is at work and he is filling us, causing us to be filled with all the fullness of God with the result that according to Ephesians 5, 17 through 21, we would be joyful. We would be speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We would be thankful, giving thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. And we would be humble. We would be submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. That naturally shows us how a marriage is supposed to be enabled, how it's supposed to gain strength, how it is that a marriage is really supposed to work. And we talked about this in the last message about really the foundation for any marriage. Yes, even the marriages of people who do not know the Lord the right foundation would still be understanding this. One of the reasons that the St. Francis Dam collapsed, as you can see here on the screen, is there was an improper foundation and there was an improper support system. Well, what is the proper foundation and the proper support system for a marriage? According to what we're finding here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, Marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. A moment ago when I read from Ephesians 5.31 and it said, for this cause, here's the cause. The cause is that marriage is a picture of Jesus Christ and his church. And we talked about these foundational views of God or foundational theological principles we could refer to them as. As you can walk through the passage and see, this message is online from last week. We had an internet outage last week, but the recording is up online now. You see in verse 23 that Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. In order to understand marriage correctly, you need to go back and understand the relationship of Jesus Christ and his church. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ sets the church apart or sanctifies it, we might say, cleansing it with the washing of the word of God. We understand that Christ will present the church to himself. This is commonly called the marriage supper of the lamb. You can see it in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 9. He will present the church to himself at the marriage supper as his pure and holy bride. Also, in verse 29, Christ is the Lord of the church and true Christians are members of the body of Christ. That second sentence becomes very pivotal in today's discussion. When we think about what it means to say that we as individual believers are members of the body of Christ. And then he starts talking about marriage and he says the husband and wife are one flesh. You can immediately see those two illustrations coming together that we are members of his body and that we understand that the husband and wife are one flesh. There's an illustration that's going on there. The better we understand that illustration, the better we understand that a marriage is a picture of Christ and his church, the better we understand marriage. People who do not know the Lord, who are married, 
are wrestling with, hey, <laughs> what's all this supposed to mean anyway? I mean, I thought we were supposed to, you know, get married and it was going to be like a, a 40 year long kiss where we only come up for air on the weekends. And, you know, everything was just going to be like wonderful. And, and we we're supposed to live happily ever after. Well, what do you do when you go through the kind of trials that Paul and Patty Hearst went through? What do you do when you go through the kind of trials that Bob and Mabel Cam went through? I mean, I mean, just think through what so many people in our congregation have gone through, the stresses and the pressures that have been on them, and ask yourself, uh, what's, how is it that you withstand that? I mean, how do you have that kind of strength to be able to face those kinds of difficulties? We learn here that a marriage then, and really any marriage, finds its deepest meaning in the mystery of Christ and his church. So every marriage is going to produce and go through difficult times, just joining two sinners. Sometimes when I'm doing premarital counsel, I'll say, okay, do we understand what we're getting ready to do here? I mean, we're getting ready to take uh, one sinner and marry that person to another sinner, and it's like, nitro and glycerin, and then we're going to shake it up real good. I mean, do we really understand what we're doing here? And what is God's, what is God's grace, his sufficient grace? Why is it necessary in a situation like this? I point back to the St. Francis Dam just for a moment, because when it broke, and there's a real difficulty here, we don't know exactly why they did this, but Mulholland and the other engineers, they actually raised the level or raise the height of the dam by 10 feet. And, and when they did, they said, oh, I'm sure there's a sufficient foundation beneath it. I'm, I'm just sure we're fine there. And then later on, they raised it another 10 feet. So, so here it was raised by 20 feet and they never slowed the project down. They said, look, a lot of people paid a lot of money. In fact, I forget one point some, something million back in those days in dollar bond issues were raised in Los Angeles. And they said, people are expecting us to keep this moving and go fast. And so we can't slow this down. I'm just sure that those additional 20 feet, I'm sure they would be well supported. But as you can see there on the screen, when the dam failed, the water rushing out, actually killing those more than 400 people went all the way down to the Pacific Ocean. They said when it reached the Pacific Ocean, it was two miles wide and still moving at five miles per hour, carrying many of the victims right along with it. You talk about a catastrophic collapse. What you're looking at here on the screen is the uh, little town of St. Paula, Paula or Palito. I'm trying to remember which one it is. Many other dams could definitely withstand these kind of pressures. Those of you who've been to say Hoover Dam and, and you understand the way it is built and the way it's established in solid rock, both below and on the sides, you know that many other dams could have faced those kind of pressures, just as there are so many other kinds of marriages, people that you know that they're married and they've gone through tremendous struggles. I mean, they've gone through just what you would almost look at as unendurable pain, and yet they were faithful to each other, and the marriage lasted. Why? Why did the marriage last? I say to you again, I believe it's an issue of the foundation upon which the marriage is built and the support system that surrounds it. What is the right foundation for a marriage? Well, we just saw this in Ephesians chapter five and verse 31. If you would go back to your scriptures there and just notice that understanding these theological principles helps us to better understand for this cause. Oh, there's a cause here. It, it's not just I like you and you like me or I love you and you love me. No, there's something deeper. There's something richer that's going on it is for this cause. What Paul is doing here is he is weaving together in his description the mystery of the church with a marriage, his portrayal of marriage. And this is very helpful to us because it helps us to recognize there is a cause to live for. 
Remember what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That is magnifying the unique excellence of our God. That's foundational that we would do that. And Jesus says on that basis, let your light so shine before men. So what this helps us to understand is, in fact, if you go back to verses 21 and 22, you can really see this. N notice when it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then immediately it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. And I pointed this out last week. I have been in some counseling situations where there was trouble, a family reached out to me, not necessarily members of our church, just we do counseling and people get together and basically the man is wanting to implement his will. He's just trying to get his wife to do what he wants him to do. And he'll say to me, preacher, somewhere in that Bible, it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. By my use of the accent, you can probably tell what area of the country I was in. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. And I will routinely go back to the previous verse and say, look at the previous verse. Look what it says about submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Sir, I would say, are you willing to submit yourself to the Lord? And by the way, are you willing to submit in other ways? In other words, there's some places where your wife ought to be taking the leadership. It says, as Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, the wife is supposed to be a keeper at home. That is, she's the one who runs the home. It uses the words oikos despotos. Oikos is house despotos. Guess what word that is in the English language? Despot, the house despot. I don't know how many times we've been working with contractors and they looked at me and said, what do you think? And I said, you know, you, you want to talk to the guy in charge or the lady that really knows what's going on. Uh, let me introduce my, my oikos despotos here. She is the house despot. I, I want to do what she wants to do. And then the contractors will often work with her. This really helps us because if you're in a marriage today or you're contemplating getting married and you're asking the question, yeah, what, what is marriage really all about? This is the passage that you want to go to. As we noted in that last passage, that last message then, what you're really looking at is not a two-way arrangement, it's a three-way arrangement. That is, that we are submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, and then throughout this passage, as you find the responsibilities of the wife and you find the responsibilities of the husband, there's this constant reference to, to the Lord, unto the Lord, even as Christ loved the church. So you begin to see, oh, the cause here that he's talking about, there's something deeper. And this is exactly what I'm referring to as a, as a foundational support or as a lateral support, because for this cause, he gave both the husband and wife this vital connection. Look, if you will, then at Ephesians chapter five and verse 22, and just notice as we read down through the verse, how these things are connected. As we read, I want you to look carefully for that foundational support, the support system, and, and see how it works. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as, Christ is the head of the church and he, Christ, is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify. The idea is that he might set it apart and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it would be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. For 
We are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones for this cause. Shall a man leave his father and mother and they shall be joined and, and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. What are we really seeing then today? Well, these are the scenes, we might say, of the spirit-filled family that we introduced last Sunday. First and foremost, you would find that by the enablement of God's spirit, and that becomes a crucial phrase here to understand, if we don't understand the filling by the Spirit of God in Ephesians 5.18, we have a really hard time with this passage. But by the enablement of God's Spirit, each wife can submit herself to her own husbands. Her own husband, forgive me. You see this in verse 22 and 24. So each wife should understand the for this cause statement. That is, she understands the authority structure under which she lives. James Strong noted about this word submit that it's a Greek military term. You say, whoa, why would that? The Greek word is hupotasso. Why, why would that be used in this context, a Greek military term? Here's the answer. You go forward one chapter and what do you find out? You find out there's a war on you find out we're in the middle of spiritual warfare. You find out that we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. You understand that the fiery darts of the wicked are just being launched down upon us. And only as we use the shield of faith can we quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. There's a war on. That's why he uses a Greek military term. And the wife who rightly understands this understands that what she is doing is she is arranging herself under, in essence, submitting. She is arranging herself under her husband because that's the way the captain of our salvation, that's the way the author and finisher of our faith, that's the way our general, if you will, Jesus Christ, that's the way he designed it. He designed us to go into this battle arranged according to order. And that becomes really, really crucial here. This word that's used here for submit, sometimes translated subject, is uh, subject ourselves. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 talks about this. The powers that be ordained of God. We should be subjected and submissive to the higher powers. You find it used in James chapter 4 and verse 7. You find it used in Luke 2.51. This is really interesting. Remember the situation where Jesus was at Jerusalem and he was answering all the questions and asking questions of these really amazing scholars and he was interacting with them. Joseph and Mary went back and found him and said, what's going on? He said, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Now, now here's what you're learning from that. I mean, Jesus is like way smarter than Mary and Joseph, right? I mean, could, could Jesus argue to them I'm better than you are. I'm smarter than you are. I'm, I'm more righteous than you are. I mean, you, you kind of pick any superlative you want to pick. And what do you find out? You find out that when it's all over, it says that Jesus went with them back to Nazareth and he submitted to them. And the very next verse says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So whether it is the wife who feels about her husband, I'm smarter than he is, I'm better than he is, I'm wiser than he is, or the child, the children in the home who feel like, yeah, well, I'm smarter than mom and dad. I'm wiser than mom and dad. I, in both cases, what you have is you have this submission, this arrangement or order that is built on God's proper foundation. There's really a second idea here that is really very much, I think we can see, and that is, especially when you include Ephesians 5.21, that every husband is demonstrating to his wife how to submit. That is, by his submission to the Lord, he is demonstrating that. And children in the home are learning about the Lord and they're learning about submission and the way that life really works just by this wonderful, if you will, laboratory that they are in, which is that home. 
Secondly, you see that by the enablement of God's spirit, and again, that's a really crucial phrase, by the enablement of God's spirit, each husband can love his wife. I would point out that you can see there on the screen, verses 25 through 32, this passage has way more to say to the husband than it has to say to the wife. And now, there's another passage that seems to say far more to the wife, but still it's this passage says far more to the husband. And so for the husbands who are here today, I would just ask you, what is your relationship with the Lord like? And what is your relationship with your wife like? Be careful to understand that without the help, without the enablement of the Holy Spirit of God, this will seem meaningless. It, it will be as if you are inside this picture frame, you're married, and here's you and your wife inside this picture frame, and you're asking, what's supposed to happen now? I mean, isn't there supposed to be more meaning to this than, than is going on? I mean, it's kind of a, you know, everyday humdrum, you know, we go through the same things every day and we end up having the same discussions and fusses and fighting and everything. Isn't there supposed to be more meaning? And the answer is yes. But it begins not with your relationship with your wife, it begins with your relationship with the Lord. You see, the Holy Spirit of God is very willing to enable you and demonstrate to you the wonderful self-sacrificial love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that really, I think, is the point he's making here. Look at what it says back in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Okay, stop the message for a minute, and let's just point this out. If we don't understand how Jesus Christ loved the church, then how in the world could we understand how to love the wife? I mean, husband, I'm asking you that question today. You see, immediately what it does, it draws you into, whoa, I need to read my Bible. I mean, I need to get in and find out how is it that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it in a self-sacrificial manner. And the better you understand that, the better you understand how to lead your wife. We would say as a true servant leader, Jesus Christ said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, that is, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is a beautiful picture here, and you need to understand this most especially through the good news of Jesus Christ. What does it say in Romans 5, 8? God commended or God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sir, does that irritating evil of your wife bother you? I mean, do, does it irritate you? Pause to think about how your own irritating evil looks in the sight of the Lord. The same Lord who gave himself for your sins and for my sins, that he gave himself for us. He loved us that much that he he loved us and gave himself for us. You begin to see, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that's, that's a whole different level of love that I was thinking about than I was thinking about for my wife. I think that's really the point. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. I pointed out in the last message, Jesus not only gave us his body on the cross, he also gave us our Bibles. He gave us the Bible so that we could bathe our soul in the wonderful words of God, cleansing our souls. Sir, when was the last time you opened your Bible with your wife? When was the last time you read to her from the scriptures and you prayed with her? Ladies, no, foot, no fear elbowing your husband at this point. Just, just hope that the Spirit of God is working through the preacher to really get this point across. If we are not bathing our marriages in the Word of God and in prayer, then the fact is we are not like the Lord Jesus Christ, and ultimately we will have all sorts of problems. He says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. 
you know, sir, when you're hammering away out there in the shop and you take the hammer and you hit the nail, but the, the nail is your thumbnail, you know, instead of the other nail, and you hit it, how does your body treat your thumb? You ridiculous thumb, why did you get in the way? That's so foolish of you to gotten away of my hammers. And you're like, no, it's my thumb. The Bible is making the point here that the husband and the wife are one flesh. And so the point he makes here is, he that loves his wife loves himself. No man ever yet hated his own flesh. You don't treat it that way when you hit your thumb with the hammer. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church, for we are members of his body. So you begin to see that that powerful illustration he's using there is not merely an illustration. There is something that is organic about this. We really are members of Christ's body. The, the husband and wife really are one flesh. They become, in essence, a new creation in Christ. And so this really helps us to understand our, our life and the way that we live it. The Bible says that the husband ought to dwell with his wife according to knowledge. I heard about one couple, they were sitting with a marriage counselor and the marriage counselor said, your wife complains that you never buy her flowers. And the man said, well, to tell the truth, I didn't know she sold flowers. Okay, you really, you really kind of missed the point there. I heard about another where uh, the pastor was asking his question, what's your wife's favorite color? You know, and we got to what's your wife's favorite flower? One good old boy said, oh, 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 I, I know that one. What's your wife's favorite flower? He said, all purpose self-rising. Yeah, well, not exactly. I mean, there's, there's more to this than just, you know, trying to get through the basics and just think, no, he's talking about dwelling with her according to knowledge so that each husband should love his wife in the same way that he loves and cherishes his own body. As a personal testimony to this, this occurred in, had to be late 1981. Harriet and I got married uh, in December of 1981, so it, it had to be late 1981. It might have been the first couple of days of 1982. One day we were in our apartment and uh, looked out and I saw that Harriet's parents had pulled up and they were uh, driving a Chevy Blazer. I still remember a beautiful old car, green with a vinyl top, vinyl white top. And I looked at Harriet and said, your parents are here. She goes, really? Why are my parents here? I said, I don't know. And here came Mr. and Mrs. Klontz. They came up the steps to our apartment and she was always carrying the most delicious baked goods. I mean, my, my mother-in-law could really cook. And she was bringing us something. We're like, oh, you know, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, we really, really appreciate this. And she's standing there and it kind of grew quiet. And she looked over at her husband, my father-in-law, Mr. Sam Klontz, and she goes like this. She kind of gives him this nod. Uh, I've realized over the years that my wife also gives me that nod, and I've realized at times, you know, how I how I learned to respond. And Mr. Klontz had this way, and he said, "Now, I mean, he I loved it when he would do that because you knew there was something really important getting ready to come." He would say, "Now," he said, "We live about six blocks away, as the crow flies, ten blocks, if you will. We li we live about ten blocks away." I'm thinking, I know that. I courted your daughter at your house, I'm very familiar with where you live. He said, we live just 10 blocks away, but we're not gonna be over here all the time, but we'll come over if you invite us. And I said, yes, sir. He said, we don't want you over at our house all the time. And, and uh, if, we, if we invite you, we'll hope you come. I said, yes, sir, uh, thank you. And then he turned to Harriet and he said these words. He said, now look, you married him. If you have troubles, don't you come running to us, the two of you work it out. And he said his piece and they went down the steps and they got in the car. Harriet could testify that I made an absolute fool out of myself because I went into our living room and I was jumping around saying, I got the world's best in-laws. I got the world's best in-laws because Mr. and Mrs. Klontz were wise enough to know exactly what this passage is saying when it says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother by implication. So should the wife leave her father and mother and be joined unto the wife and they too shall be one flesh. 
All of this works because, as we pointed out throughout the message, both this Sunday and last Sunday, by the enablement of God's spirit, each married couple can paint a picture of Jesus Christ in his church. Look, if you will, at verse 33, because there it just really comes into sharp focus. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Ma'am, do you know what the greatest need of your husband is? It is to be respected. It is to be reverenced. When you hear the word respect, okay, I have on my head here a set of spectacles. Think about that word spect, respect. The real point is that you give it double weight, that, that you give it a second look. Question, which one, generally speaking, in most marriages, which one is the better talker? the husband or the wife? Which one is more verbally adept, the husband or the wife? What say you? Yeah, it's the wife. Women are far better at, at words and communication generally than most men. Men tend to be a little quieter. They tend not to say as much. But what this passage means is that though he may not say as much, what he does say is worthy of double respect. Sir, look at verse 33 and notice what it says. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. What's the wife's greatest need? It is to be loved. What happens when there's problems inside a marriage? The man doesn't feel respected, and so he doesn't because of that. He says, well, I'm not going to show love to my wife, okay? Or the wife doesn't feel loved, and she says, I'm not going to show respect to my husband. And that's exactly how so many standoffs have occurred over the years. In fact, it's astounding to me to sit in marital counseling and work with couples on this and try to help them understand. If you want a really great book on this, Malcolm Egrich, uh, E-G-G-E-R-I-C-H, has written a great book called Love and Respect to really help couples work through this very area. Because, sir, here's what the Lord wants you to do. He wants you to love your wife. He wants you to be what you want her to become even if she's not up to it right now. He, he still wants you to lead by example. Ma'am, what the Bible wants you to do, what the Lord wants you to do is show an example, be an example, even if your husband is not obeying the Lord. I put this in the footnotes there, but you can look down at 1 Peter chapter 3 and notice how the wife's obedience, the wife's submission is a powerful, powerful influence on an unbelieving or disobedient husband. So what happens in all these situations? Well, as I've tried to point out throughout the message, what you really have happening here is you have a situation where an improper foundation, an improper support system will cause catastrophic failures. For some strange reason, and nobody knows exactly what this is, William Mulholland had actually inspected this very site in 1911. And when he did, he said about this site, look, these hills, these mountains, if you will, they are just absolutely shot through with what's called schist, S-C-H-I-S-T. And the idea is it's granular metamorphic rock that can be easily divided into little thin plates. And here's what happened. When they did build the dam there and the waters came up, it absolutely saturated those hills. It saturated that schist foundation underneath that dam. And then it was just a matter of time. Hindsight's always 2020. Those who inspected it afterward realized, oh, this was a terrible mistake. This, this should never have been built here this way. Today, you and I have to ask the question about our marriages. Am I on a right foundation? Here's the joy of it. You go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 20, 33. The Lord is the marvelous engineer. He can put the foundation under it, even if you're already married. He can show you how to get, your, how to get on a solid rock. 
and to have a solid support system. Both the walls, as you can see here on either side of the dam, they failed and there was what's called hydrostatic uplift that had actually apparently lifted up those two sections on either side, all because it was so saturated. The dam collapsed because of its poor foundation and insufficient surrounding support. Many a marriage has suffered for that very same reason. How grateful I am to my in-laws for the way that they treated our marriage inside a congregation. We have to have respect for each other's marriages. We have to demonstrate that same kind of support system, do everything we can to help marriages succeed because it honors God to do so. What are we learning today? We're really learning that as part of a spirit-filled family, that marriage is a picture of Jesus Christ and his church. Listen, God has given us everything we need to do his will. Now will you and I do it. Shall we bow our heads together? Lord, how I praise you today for the understanding you've given us from your word about the right foundation and the right support system. Help us, Lord. There have been so many marriages that have failed and they have been catastrophic failures. Children, even grandchildren have been hurt and plagued by memories of dissension and discussions that have gone on. Lord, I pray today that you would help us to go back to the scriptures, to put the word of God into practice, and to demonstrate that you really can be praised and honored in the way that we live our lives. Because for this cause, which you have given us, we can find the right foundation, the right support system, and we really can live our lives to the glory of God. Be with us. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.